are in a, in a situation where there are people who try to learn swimming by distance education, which you can't. Obviously, you can't learn swimming by <coughs> postal tuition. You have to get involved. You have to be part of the process. You have to jump into the water. And therefore, spiritual experience is also one such. It is not just a philosophical exercise of your learning a process of uh, understanding the Bhagavad Gita or the Quran or the Bible or whatever text you follow. But it is a question of your getting involved in it in serious terms and becoming uh, one who is capable of experiencing that supreme joy, that ecstasy that comes out of your relationship with the divine. It is very rare that we come across somebody who has gone through that experience, who has lived this experience, and who can at the same time talk to you. I requested uh, Sri Yam uh, to speak about his personal experience of his travels in the Himalayas and his meeting great personalities who are realized souls, this great seer among men, Sri Mumtaz Ali Khan, Guru M to all of us. He is not on a pedestal as a guru. He is with you like a friend. He is one who guides you by your hand. He takes you along his path. He is, there is no distance between you, between the disciple and the guru in this case. And therefore, it makes it all the more easy for a disciple to follow him. Akhanda mandala karam vyaptam yenu characharam tatpadam darshitam yenu tasmai shri guruve namaha Jnanati Mirandasya Jnananjanam Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Yenutasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwara Guru Sakshat Parapuram Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha From young age he has described that I was born uh, in a Muslim family but from a very young age my interest was always in first in spiritual matters and more than that in the Hindu way of life and Hindu philosophy. How could this come about when you are born in a particular uh, setup and when you are trained from childhood in a particular religion, is it possible for the mind of a young child to shift from one way of thinking to another at that age? In the Madhuri Uru, question varu. Fact is, I believe and it is also my personal experience that one passes through many lives. What we see in this life is a very short life from birth to death. But before this there have been many more and after this there may be many more to come. So there are many influences working inside our mind which move us towards a certain way of life. Which is why in one family you may have four children and the four children may turn out in four different ways. In the same way, there is a possibility that someone who was influenced in his past one life or many lives in a particular way of life is born in a different setup in this life and continues to move along this path. Now this biography of mine which is an autobiography, apprentice to a Himalayan master, a yogi's autobiography. It's an attempt to put to the public, to the readers, these experiences which I have had since my childhood. Some of them even cover a little bit of what is before this life, which people may believe or may not believe. That is not the, the, the intention is to make one understand what I have experienced in my life. From childhood to now, I am 63 years old now. This is the whole thing. Now, it is also an attempt to show that one can also live a normal life, so called normal life. You may not be absolutely normal. Have a family, have your children, do your work, earn your living, and still be spiritually inclined. There is no uh, bar on this, provided we are a little careful in what we do and how we live. 
Now, there must be a basic starting point for all this. It has to be somewhere where I really began to see something different. And that point, I would say, uh, first of all, I must say that what is the truth from this philosophical and religious point of view, spiritual point of view, cannot actually be expressed in words. And when we express something in words, actually it cannot be the absolute truth, because truth cannot be put into any language or any words. So, we can only describe our lives and how we are connected to that truth. We cannot actually describe the truth because it is not possible to do so humanly. So, what I am trying to start with now is the first point which you might call the first impulse which prompted me to move in this direction of understanding the spiritual truths. Why understanding the spiritual truths? Going from the southern end of India, which is in Kerala, in Trivandrum, go straight up to the Himalayas at the age of 19. Now, there has to be something that ignites this, some process, some impulse. And that impulse, I will tell you a little story about how this happened to me when I was a small child of around eight and a half, nine years old. Now, as already I told you, my parents belonged to the Islamic religion. They were not orthodox, but they followed generally the principles. And I was the eldest son among three, and among three children. And therefore, they had great hopes that I would also take up some kind of a business career and make money as they did. So we were financially quite well off when I was a child. And this was in Trivandrum, which is the capital of Kerala. Although I was born and brought up in Kerala, we speak, we used to speak Urdu at home because we do not originally belong to Kerala, but we are a hundred year ago settlers to Kerala from the north. Now, behind our house in Trivandrum, which many of our friends have seen, the house, there was a very big backyard, the garden. And in that backyard, there was a jackfruit tree, big jackfruit tree. Tamil, uh, jackfruit, panas, panas, something like that. Okay. Under the jackfruit tree, one evening, when I was playing, and when everybody else had gone home, uh, it must have been around 6 o'clock, 6.15 in the evening. I saw under the jackfruit tree, which is in the last end of the garden, somebody standing. Now, there was nobody there before, but then when I turned and looked, the person was standing there again. I looked from far. He was a tall man. Mm -hmm very fair, bare bodied, except for a small cloth around the waist, and long hair which was matted and kept like a crown on the head. And he was wearing some beads in his neck, which now I know were the Rudraksha uh, beads, but then I did not know. I have never seen Rudraksha in my life at that age. And he had a water pot in his hand, which now I identify as a Kamandalu. So I looked back and uh, he waved his hand in a gesture saying, come forward. Normal reaction is at this time to be afraid and not go because there is a stranger standing there. We don't know where he has come from. But I moved forward. And as I approached him close by and stood looking at him, I think I was quite stunned because I was just looking at him and wondering, who is this man? Because the eyes were extraordinarily bright and large. He gestured for me to go closer, so I went closer. He put his hand on my head and said in Hindi, when the time comes, everything will be all right. That's the only sentence uttered. Chap samay hoga, sab thik ho jayega. Now, because we speak Urdu at home, I understood exactly what he said. 
and then I stood rooted to the spot looking at this person. After some, I don't know, maybe few seconds, he told me, Vapas jao, go back. So, like a robot, I turned and went back towards the house. Now, the last uh, door at the back of the garden is the kitchen door. So, I came up to the kitchen door and I turned around to see if there was anybody under the jackfruit tree. There was nobody under the jackfruit tree. I am not saying that I saw him disappear, but when I turned and looked, there was nobody there. Now, I went into the kitchen and I remember that my mother was cooking something. Now, what happens when a boy of nine sees something extraordinary? He has to tell somebody. So, my mother is the nearest person I can talk to. So, I went to my mother and I wanted to tell her that I saw somebody standing under the jackfruit tree and he has blessed me. But every time I tried to say this to her, I could not speak. My uh, throat used to get jammed. My tongue used to get stuck. So, I decided maybe this is not something which we should discuss. I tried it a few times, but it never worked. But something extraordinary happened to me after that time. And that was, every night when I went to sleep, around midnight, I would be woken up from my sleep. Not by anybody, but I used to just wake up. And then, we used to all sleep in one room. My father, my mother, we all used to sleep in one room those days. So, I had to get up quietly and sit without disturbing anybody. So, I used to get up, sit quietly on the bed, sometimes lie down on the bed because I don't, didn't want anybody to see what was happening. And there was a very uh, blissful, happy feeling in the heart center somewhere here. And a kind of silvery light of something rotating. Nobody had taught me anything about this before. So, I used to lie down, close my eyes, put both my hands on that area, in that area and just allow myself to see that light. Sometimes the light would go and I would see those beautiful eyes of the person I saw under the jackfruit tree. Sometimes the eyes would melt away and there would be only this beautiful light which spread throughout the body and one would feel very, very happy and blissful. This experience continued every night for several years. Apart from that, during this time, I used to have several other experiences about which, even though I have written the autobiography, I do not think it is a good idea to discuss. We will keep it for the future. Anyway, so this continued. Now, after this, all the books and all the knowledge that is required to walk on the spiritual journey began to unfold itself to me in different ways. Like, if I used to go to the library, you must remember that by now I was growing up. This happened when I was 9, then I was 10, 11. As I grew up, I started visiting the library and there somebody would say, oh, this book is good for you, read it. I would get books by complete works of Swami Vivekananda at the age of 11 and 12. It is not easy to read Vivekananda, but since I was educated in the English medium, reading English was not a problem for me and we went to the best schools and I had the best teachers. Still, some things I read and understood, some things I did not, but what I am trying to say is that all the knowledge that is required began to come in mysterious ways. Somebody giving you a book or you go to the library and you are searching for a book and some book falls from the top and falls in your hands. We cannot explain this. I mean, Then, I also started meeting people who were highly spiritual, who were in that locality. My first experience of seeing a spiritual person was that one day, I was standing in 
in my house when I was maybe 11 years old, wearing shorts and bare body. And from the road, I heard some sound of uh, bhajan kirtan. Somebody's playing drums and there's a sound of uh, cymbals. And I was curious, so I went and looked and I saw that a group of people were playing drums and playing cymbals. And there was one man walking in front, wearing only a cowpeen, a small cowpeen, covering his private parts, a fair looking tall man. And his eyes were closed. He was walking, but there were tears coming down his eyes. And he seems to be smiling. This is the first thing I saw. When I saw this, I felt something very nice. And there were two boys were collecting money. So I ran inside took some money which was lying there and brought it and gave it late and I saw the neighbors coming out and washing the feet of this gentleman who was walking in front. Later on I came to know that it was someone called Swami Abhedananda who had an ashram not far from our house in the fort and when I was in college I used to visit him frequently and have long chats with him many, many times. This was the first experience. And this continued. Wherever there was a holy man nearby, somehow or the other, I would be exposed to that person. This included Hindus, Muslims. There were some Muslim saints. There was a Muslim saint who lived close by whom I used to go and visit. You might say Muslim saint meaning a Sufi saint, like a Darga. When you go to a Darga, it's not a mosque. It's not a place where you do your prayers. It is a tomb of a great saint. That's called a darga. A place where people worship is called masjid. But generally both are kept together so that people can go down and then come and worship. And so it continued till the age of 19 when I decided to quit and go off to the Himalayas one fine day. So as I was saying, extraordinary people whoever came to the neighborhood, I would somehow get an opportunity to meet them. Now, I was a little weak in mathematics. So, there was a, a group, a family living near our house where there was Mr. Ramaswamy, who was actually an accountant in the Accountant General's office. And uh, my friend Martha Pillai was his uh, nephew. Martha Pillai later on became a very famous neurologist in Trivandrum. He was head of the department of neurology in Trivandrum. Now he runs his own hospital. The, I used to go to their house because Mr. Ramaswamy used to teach me mathematics tuition. So one day when I went there, that must have been when I was around 10, 10 years old. I went to uh, Ramaswamy's house, Marthandan's house. And they told me today there is no tuition. I said, why? No, 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 Swami has come, so there is no tuition. So I said, which Swami has come? No, 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 you will not be interested. Um, Swami ji has come. Then, Marthand and my friend Marthand's mother came out. That is Mr. Ram Swami's aunt. And she said, our Swami, they, they used to talk in Tamil, but they were pillays settled in Trivandrum. She said, our uh, Swami Vandir Kare, there is no tuition today. And half Malayalam in the tuition illa. So I said, all right. Then I said, can I also see the Sami? Mm, she said, I'll have to find out. You stand here. So she went inside. It was a small house with little doors, old model house. She went inside. And after some time, she came out. And she said, um, come inside. So I, I go inside. There is a small drawing room, very small. In that, there is one chair in the middle. On that chair, somebody is sitting. Agarbattis are lit and some people are standing around like this. And there is a man sitting in front. Now, normally if you see a Swami, you will think somebody with kashaya, vastra or some matted, nothing. Hair short cut, like a summer crop white hair, well-built, clean-shaved, slack shirt up to here, 
white slack shirt nicely ironed white dhoti and one white cloth tied like a cross belt we individual sitting there they have put a small foot stool to put his legs on so he saw me they must have told who i was so he very lovingly said malayalam come here so i went come here stop so i sat down then he put his hands on my head and massage the head nicely and he said nalla kutti good boy he said good boy he kept on repeating this and then i looked at his eyes now these eyes were also quite powerful they were not so big they were small eyes but there was something very quite extraordinary about it because for some time my mind became absolutely blank there was nothing no there was no thinking there was, there was nothing i don't know how to describe it for some time i was in a vacuum and then i i quickly woke up because he was still rubbing my head and i got up i also did namaskar i saw everybody doing namaskar so i also we are not accustomed to doing namaskar in the house i did namaskar and i came off that was my only meeting with this great man later on i came to know through various sources also by reading a book which are his little talks that his name was gopala swami his name was actually gobala pillai and he was uh, working in the accountant general's office or something took voluntary retirement he was there and i don't think he was in the account general's office he used to go to court every day because he had many property cases and uh, he was unmarried but he was a great saint Thank you.